The madness and monstrosity lay in the figures in the foreground, for Pickman's morbid art was preeminently one of demoniac portraiture. These figures were seldom completely human, but often approached humanity in varying degree. Most of the bodies, while roughly bipedal, had a forward slumping and vaguely canine cast. The texture of the majority was a kind of unpleasant rubberiness. Through ghoul-guarded gateways of slumber, past the wan-mooned abysses of night, I have lived o'er many lives without number. I have sounded all things with my sight. In the classic weird fiction universe that both Conan and the Cthulhu mythos belong to, just as Deep Ones act as a great literary gateway into dealing with the monsters of the sea, so too do ghouls act as our bridge into adventuring through the lands of dream. The dreamlands of Earth, or Kuth the Star Girdle as they are collectively called in the Hyborian Age, will be getting their own long-form video in the future, but we will be touching on it here, as it is essential for understanding the monsters in question. In a simple sentence, Kuth is an afterlife, physical location, and child universe inside our own, created from the culmination of the subconscious potential for creation present within all living things. This is demonstrated by the dreaming of the blind idiot god Azathoth, who has created all of reality as we know it, and should he ever awake, the universe will simply end. It can be traveled to in one's sleep, and through portals in the waking world. Living in the dreamlands for multiple generations changes the makeup of a species to reflect the easily warped reality that a place called the dreamlands would imply. As this was also the case for the first ghoul Yagash, we must understand that their evolutionary path did not follow the usual rules for men or demons when talking about their morphology or cultural manifestations. In this video, we will be covering what ghouls are, how humans become them, and the psychedelic morbid culture they possess. Now pass with me through the Cavern of Flame as we begin our twisted astral expedition to the mass graves of many a realm. Grim Dark. Half off! Ghouls are living beings that resemble naked jackal or hyena men, often with a human hairline. While not undead, they do venerate death, and similar, but not exact to our theory of Acheronian psychology, seem to have an inverted view of health or wellness in many cases. They are described as a parody of life, hungry for flesh, sometimes living but mostly dead in terms of what they eat. As this creature has been wrongfully depicted many times, we must go over a general understanding of their body plan. The canine features of the ghoul are present on their hind legs, fingertips, and heads. They possess a human hairline, torso, and arms. Skin and hair color can differ dramatically, but all of them have a rubbery quality to the skin, and the most common eye color is an albino red. Tails, in terms of individual ghouls, can sometimes be present, though they're usually stubby. Long-tailed ghouls would be very rare. Despite me describing their heads as jackal or hyena-like, this is more in reference to their foraging patterns as scavengers. In truth, they can resemble any naked or bald canine. However, even this is not so simple, as ghouls have taken many forms over their dramatically sickening existence on this earth. Many ghouls appear to have decayed flesh, but this is likely due to a flesh-eating bacteria they have both contracted and view as a sign of good health, as their nature is partially informed by the reality-warping dreamlands. Ghouls just as easily dramatically rise in number as recede. A ghoul can be born from other ghouls. A human baby can be taken or stolen, who over time and spending their years of puberty with ghouls will take on the ghoul's form and soul. An adult human can become a ghoul by joining a cult of Mordigian, or another ghoul cult that uses the ghoul manuscript which seems to hold the secret of warping men into monsters, and ghoul children can be left with a human family before puberty who will take on a human form as a survival mechanism, but revert to their ghoulish form when in the presence of their kin or venturing to the dreamlands as they are said to retain a ghoulish soul. As ghouls frequently travel to the dreamlands, and Kuth is also regarded as an afterlife, it can be theorized that the reason ghouls venerate death so much is that upon death they merely appear in the dreamlands, from which they are free to either stay or find their way back to Earth through their various ghoul tunnels. With strange eons, even death may die, but those eons are far off for this race of morbid dreamers who merely view death as a new beginning. While being a ghoul can be a great boon for the nihilistic individuals who desire it, all it takes is two generations of one's bloodline being raised in human homes for ghoulishness to totally disappear from a family. 
as many ghouls are converted from humans and live in opposition to them, they may very well view themselves as immortal, while their former human compatriots as nothing more than prey, if not simply inferior. Most ghouls are naturally nocturnal, but suffer no consequence from the sunlight. For the purposes of this video, we have broken down ghouls into the following five types. First are the common ghouls, which have already been described. Second are what we can call skinwalkers, as represented by the character Richard Upton Pickman in Pickman's Model, where our opening quote today is from. Ghoul children, adopted by human parents, will appear human when in the company of other humans, but when in the company of only ghouls, or traveling to the dreamlands, they will take on the ghoulish form of their souls. Third are those who live on the Plateau of Lang, in the far north of Earth's dreamlands. While not in any true way different from common ghouls, they push the limits for the appearance a ghoul may have. Many have blue or green skin, and other outlandish qualities, practically resembling fantasy hobgoblins in some cases. As ghouls are partially human, they can succumb to impishness. When a human is starving near a demonic-influenced or outer-dark corrupted area, their body will try to make up for the lack of calories with demonic energy, resulting in a devolving process. The human becomes a deformed, smaller, bulky version of their former self, and is converted into a minor demon. On the Isle of Sipta, we can see ghouls transported from the dreamlands through the Maelstrom weather event, which acts as a portal between Kuth and Earth, starving, resulting in the same process. Impishness is characterized by three-fingered hands, three-toed feet, and asymmetrical features. When the first two qualities are present, but no deformity is, this is a sign of multiple generations of breeding subject to normal human evolution, or animal evolution. Lastly are those ghouls who are truly undead. While initially I was not going to include these, their elongated faces mutated into snout show a genuine connection to real Yagashian ghouls. What has most likely occurred is a rarity, as they, like the impish ghouls, are subject to unique circumstances, being only found near the ruins of Acheron in Tortage. It is likely that a picked necromancer, which can be seen summoning the dead on the Isle of Tortage, accidentally opened a portal to the dreamlands through waking dreaming or the act of dreaming while awake. Calling a ghoul to a dead body is not a hard feat, but instead of materializing in the real world with the body they're used to, they find themselves in the dead body they wish to consume. The result is the head of the corpse changing into something half ghoul, half man, as well as this new creature being animal-like in mentality under the complete control of the necromancer in question. Ghouls travel often, and it is in their nature, in fact, to be quite nomadic. Being ever in search for what the ghoul manuscript refers to as the choicest of meats found in delightfully ripe, rotting graveyards. This means traveling through subterranean caves and portals referred to simply as ghoul tunnels. This is also the reason that you're going to hear the word ghoul much more than I would have liked to put in this script, but here it is. Some of these tunnels exist in the physical world. Some are portals to the dreamlands, and some are theorized to go beyond Kuth to other planets entirely. The portals always come out in graveyards or places known for mass death. When a new place of death is discovered, a pack of ghouls may dig a new tunnel to that location, connecting it with a larger network. The chief tunnel connecting the ghouls of Earth to the dreamlands leads to the Crag of Ghouls in the Underworld region, overlooking the bone-filled Vale of Panath, which is legend to be the old spot of the once sacred ancient ghoul city of Midian that was destroyed when ghouls were forced to Earth for the first time. The ghouls worship a pantheon of great old ones, or individual horrors associated with death depending on the cult or pack in question. First is Shaurash Ho, who is said to be the father of all ghouls. Though he is the son of Cthulhu, he does not appear to be made for any specific purpose like Dagon, though we may never know this as he most likely soon entered the dreamlands after being born or created. As an unknowable great old one, he then mated with one of the men of the dreamlands. These properties together created the first of these highly unique creatures in the form of Yagash, who was theoretically the first of the ghoul pharaohs in an ancient civilization that existed in the dreamlands, which may have resembled Earth's Stygia, later becoming ancient Egypt. Cthulhu himself does not appear to be directly venerated by ghouls, which points further in the direction that they are more divorced from mainstream, if one could call it that, great old ones due to their early evolutionary stages in the highly chaotic Kuth. 
Minor gods would include the idiot great ones who rule the dreamlands of Earth, of which there are many in number, Bout Zuqua Mog, their god of pestilence who resembles a giant flying scorpion, Bast, their cat god of pleasure, which would later be adopted by the ancient Egyptians of Earth, and Sinothogles, which is referred to as a great claw that murders all those who summon it. It is due to these gods that we can derive disease, hedonism, and murder as virtues of the ghoul mind. It is also the case that since Bout Zuqua Mog resides on another planet and is said to have no human followers, that we can derive some ghoul tunnels going to other planets. What passes for their higher culture seemingly comes from the influence of two gods in particular, Nyarlathotep, who is called the Black Pharaoh, and Mordigian, who is called the Great Ghoul, often thought of as an incarnation of Shurash Ho himself. While Nyarlathotep was clearly the first god of the ghoul race, as Yagash accompanies him wherever he may go in the Star Girdle, Mordigian would be responsible for dictating the writing of the ghoul manuscript, referred to as the Charnel Text, with Mordigian himself being titled the Charnel God, which is also the title of the first story he appeared in by Clark Ashton Smith. Given the context that the text and surrogate family oriented, even friendly if you can look past the various murder attempts nature of ghouls is, this outlines their god of darkness to be one chiefly concerned with both the well-being and standard of living of ghouls as a race. This is often why it is debated as to whether Mordigian is either a great old one spawned from Shurash Ho, who views ghouls as his kin, or an incarnation of the ghoul father himself. Before we get into the ghoul manuscript, it is necessary to go a bit deeper into Nair Lethotep as we have not yet done so. Also called the Crawling Chaos and Messenger of the Outer Gods, the thing that separates Nair Lethotep from every other Lovecraftian deity is his level of activity in the world, as well as a semi-definable personality. He has a direct sense of style, often disguising himself as a joyous thin man made of pure shadow. As his name would suggest, he loves causing chaos in the waking world, and most relevant for this video, hates or detests being in charge of the dreamlands, which is where the decree that no man waking may enter likely comes from. From his sense of style, which shows a preference for gold, we get his identity of the Black Pharaoh, and is most likely why the Ghoul Manuscript speaks of Ghoul Pharaohs very likely imitating Nyarlathotep to the best of their ability. In reference again to him being more relatable, despite him being more of an active threat than Cthulhu himself, he is a messenger god to the court of Azathoth. This means that when Yog sothoth or shub nigaroth or any other outer god give him an order, he has to follow it. Hence why he is guarding over Kuth and the idiot great ones who are very true to their name. When looking at the example set by Nair Lethotep as a nightmarish trickster figure with a twisted sense of humor who loves to cause mass death, it's easy to see where ghouls get the foundation of their culture. Like Nair Lethotep, they parody the ordered lives of those around them by living as chaotically as possible. This also hits on the most disturbing thing about ghouls, which is that they in many cases cannot be distinguished from humans in any kind of test. They are, for all intents and purposes, humans of some variety, but their own race given their extreme distinction from the rest of the species, which is often only visible among others of their same kind. It is unknown whether or not Nyarlathotep actually enjoys the company of ghouls, but he may, as Yagash is one of his allies. Then again, as we're about to go over, he may also be the reason ghouls left the dreamlands in the first place. Found within the cults of Mordigian, who was worshipped by those humans wishing to become ghouls, and Yagashians themselves, the ghoul manuscript is described in most sources as of typical ghoul workmanship, which indicates being bound in human flesh, hinged with curved human bones, and written in barely eligible blood, ink, or feces. As most of the tome is indecipherable, here is what we know the text contains. A creation myth of ghouls, how to select flesh for proper consumption, how to throw feasts for those ghouls who aspire to old Nyarlathotep-influenced dream culture, entitled Feasts of Nitocris, and how to properly worship Mordigian. The creation myth is less of a myth and more the story of how ghouls found their way to Earth, and why they are very nomadic in nature. Effectively, ghouls lived under Nyarlathotep in the dreamlands in a place called the Garden of Midian, which we mentioned previously in the video. This was located again in the underworld area. This is where ghoul old high culture came from. 
After this, many ghouls were taught the ways of black magic by an entity referred to in the script as a great black dragon, which taught them of the outer gods, thus giving them knowledge of the thing which ruled over them, as well as knowledge of eldritch magic in general. This great black dragon was very likely more Digian, though since we know Nyarlathotep hates ruling over the dreamlands, it could also have been himself looking for an excuse to banish them. This could also be another possible identity for Mordigian, as Nyarlathotep is said to take on many forms as part of his identity. Due to this knowledge, they were viewed as tainted and cast out of their paradise onto Earth. Of course, upon dying, we know that ghouls simply find themselves back in the dreamlands, but they are also unwelcome in Kuth. They can travel to Earth, but are obviously not welcome there either. Thus, the life of a ghoul is to travel from land to land, even beyond the stars, in search of a new home. When the ghoul dies, they simply appear in the Dreamland's underworld to begin the process again. Today, the only sign of Midian left is a giant nomadic ghoul colony which refers to itself as the City of Midian. It is worth noting here that ghoul culture is incredibly diverse, and this is very likely in part due to the fact that they vary extremely in intellect. As they are both part bestial and view contracting diseases as a good omen, this results in some ghouls who are incredibly civilized and others who are themselves insane or feral. An aspect of ghoul morphology is absorbing memories from the dead they feast on, which adds to their natural sense of identity confusion. In terms of mentality, I would separate ghoul societies into four classifiers. Firstly, cults, which may include humans and are sedentary for the most part due to human involvement. Second are packs, which contain only ghouls and are mostly nomadic. Thirdly, we will use the term drunk to refer to ghouls who have receded in intellect and sober, to refer to ghouls which retain a high culture with a coherent sense of identity, despite their dietary norms. Packs of drunken ghouls are self-explanatory, as they have receded in intellect and exist solely as beasts, instinctively roaming ghoul tunnels in search of their next graveyard or prey to feast on. Packs of sober ghouls will stay in an area so long as the dead come in great number for them to consume. Their next meal often coming from humans, who in majority they will leave alone as to allow them to die of natural causes, which is better for a scavenging spot's longevity. More humans means more corpses. These are the ghouls who appear as a parody of life to humans for reasons just went over through the other entirety of the pined part of this video. They have no human attachments, may attack a human intruder, and view humans as laughably pathetic or weak something to ignore or kill for entertainment. A sober cult of ghouls will most likely have a primarily religious identity, worshipping some variation of Nyarlathotep, Mordigian, or in rare cases other gods we've mentioned. Most likely this would be Mordigian, as it would allow them to offer a form of salvation to those humans willing to go through the wicked rites and sacrifices to become a ghoul, thus ultimately immortal from the perspective of a human. Finally, Drunk cults would most likely be those who have begun stealing the babies of humans on instinct as a form of reproduction rather than reproduce themselves. This would explain their sedentary behavior. As they have receded in intellect, they have most likely contracted a disease or severe level of madness to allow for the occurrence. Because of this, we can assume their god was very likely Bout Zuqua Mog, or they could be venerating Cthulhu as their grandfather creator deity as madness is often associated with his worship. While I didn't mention it in the gods section of this video, Yog sothoth and his Darfarian interpretation as Yog the god of cannibals is also a good contender for ghoul worship for obvious reasons. If you don't want to include Bast as one of the gods your ghouls worship, a good substitution would be Shabnigaroth, also called Ishtar in the Hyborian Age. This is also a god of ritualistic pleasure and blood orgies. I mentioned this in part one of our All Gods and Conan podcast series. A link to that can be found below. When it comes to ghoul personalities, I am generalizing here, so it is important to note that ghouls of sound mind are deeply individualistic in terms of their identities. Ghoul cults, therefore, can be present at any level of society. A court advisor is just as much a suspect as a gravedigger. As ghouls are individualistic, they have individual biases, some of which are pro either the people they knew when they were human, either trying to convert them to a cult or protect them from other ghouls. Other biases may include a deep-seated superiority complex, which may cause them to hunt those same men for sport. While the ghoul tongue is as indecipherable as their handwriting, it has been described as a kind of meeping or gibbering. In regards to the hierarchical structure of ghoul packs, there most likely isn't one. 
In rejection of order and parity of life, they most likely have a communal sense of both tribe and property. Given that in most cases, members would be leaving and joining frequently, having the group dependent on any one ghoul would not be advantageous to hunting flesh or scavenging for flesh. That being said, more bestial ghoul packs may follow a wolf-like pack structure having alphas, betas, etc. Given that most tend to be naked, they also wouldn't really care for material possessions, especially if being reincarnated will just result in them losing them anyway. This concludes what we have on ghouls in the lore. The rest of this video will be on the Lovecraft connections to the mythos, real-life myths, and story ideas. Stick around if you enjoy that kind of thing. There are three cases in which we can see an act of truly pouring oneself into their work on the part of author H.P. Lovecraft. The first is in the author of the Necronomicon, Abdul Hazrad, which was one of Lovecraft's first pen names, having an obsession with Arabian culture ever since he read Arabian Nights when he was a little boy. The second is in Randolph Carter, who is held up as an aspirational figure in his stories, coming to full terms with who he is as a person, eventually earning the respect of the god Yog sothoth who calls him a real man, and finally, in his personal letters, which remained unpublished until 1965 when Arkham House released them. While there are a lot of lies told about H.P. Lovecraft's views and life, one thing that was very true was that he was abused as a child. His mother would frequently refer to him as not worth being seen in public or as ugly, and he developed a fear of inheriting dysgenic traits as a result. It is perhaps a sign of his own self-development as a person and growth as a writer that he was able to put both him and his mother as canon future descendants of Yagash the first ghoul. Over the course of H.P. Lovecraft's writings from a psychoanalytical perspective, we can see serious self-growth through the stories A Shadow Over Innsmouth, the entire Randolph Carter series, and these letters. Lovecraft went from viewing himself as a madman destined to be pulled apart by invisible forces, to desiring to be in control of his own life through Randolph Carter, and finally, before tragically dying of cancer in his mid-forties, a self-realized person. I have a mini-documentary on the author linked below. He was truly another great man taken before his time. His dreamland setting and other creations can be found as a direct influence on the Isle of Sipta setting in the DLC of the same name for Conan Exiles. These include the ghouls we mentioned earlier, the Blood Moon Beast, Doles, Migo, Bakrug, and the Voiceless Ones, or Thunha. Across the West and Middle East, there are two origins for the ghoul, as depicted in Lovecraft's mythos and as a consequence, Howard's Hyboria. The first, of course, are the Arabic ghouls, spelled G-H-U-L, rather than how it is spelled here. Skinwalkers, in the guise of gorgeous women, would stalk graveyards in search of flesh to eat. While depicted similar to Lovecraft's ghouls, like many in this video, they had bovine hind legs rather than canine ones. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to find Lovecraft-accurate ghouls online. The second myth is one like the ghouls we're talking about today is wrongfully associated with werewolves. This is the western myth of Cynocephaly or dog-headed men. These creatures do not change shape in any way, have a culture of mostly cannibalism, and are often described as a parody of life by their detractors, but redeemable beings with souls by their advocates. At one point in history, Cynocephaly were such an accepted myth in Europe that the debate was not over whether or not they were real, but instead, whether they could be converted to Christianity. Saint Christopher was originally depicted as a large Cynocephaly carrying Christ on his back. This is what is meant by the name Christopher, Christ Bearer. Of course, the original dogman in European lore comes to us from Greece in the form of King Lycaon, who seeks to feed Zeus a meal of human flesh and as punishment is turned into a wolf-headed man. Once again, we have the culture of cannibalism, throwing feasts, as we talked about in this video, and being a parody of life, in this case offending the king of the gods. In the Egyptian world, of course, we can also view the jackal-headed god Anubis associated with death, as well as Nitocris, spelled with a C instead of a K, which was the name of a female pharaoh often associated with the god in question in later writings. We can easily see how parts of each of these myths led to the creation we see today. If any of our ghoul manuscript sections sounded familiar to you, then you're probably familiar with the 1990 cult classic horror film Clive Barker's Nightbreed which took much inspiration from these letters and Lovecraft's ghouls. However, the concept is fused with the demons of Christianity. In the movie, a man effectively becomes one of the Nightbreed, who are basically more diverse demonic-looking ghouls in a graveyard. He has to deal with both his new life as a monster and worrying about being framed as a serial killer. 
The city of Midian is featured as an actual place that phases in and out of reality, and themes of reality warping are plentiful. 1927's Pickman's Model is a wonderful bit of world-building and the first long-form, ghoul-focused story of Lovecraft, with its titular character being featured again in the dream quest of Unknown Kadath, which is where we get our idea of skinwalkers from. 1926's The Outsider is easily the most underrated story Lovecraft has concerning ghouls. I don't want to say his most underrated story, I think his most underrated setting are the dreamlands. I think everyone knows the, the Cthulhu mythos, but... His most underrated story concerning ghouls, yes, is The Outsider. It is simply about a ghoul who forgot that he was one surviving on the memories of his last meal, which he was using to lie to himself about being human, effectively dealing with the trauma of being a ghoul. You remember what we talked about earlier with Lovecraft coming to terms with who he is and growing his confidence through writing about ghouls to some degree? Thinking that he's a man trapped in a dungeon, he eventually escapes into what is obviously a cemetery in which he rejoices in the fact that he remembers what he is after he inevitably is woken up to that fact by scaring people. Like He at first is dealing with the thing that caused him to run to the cellar in the first place and he tries to go back but he can't because the door is closed, because he had the moment of self-development, and it's actually a very triumphant story. What started as a horror story ends as a message about self-growth and acceptance. He runs off into the night in what I will always remember to be both a horrific and whimsical fashion, giving the story a morbid happy ending. And that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about. It's morbid whimsy is the feeling the ghoul is supposed to invoke. It's supposed to do that. You know, there's this kind of characteristic where, yes, it's a warning about all the things you shouldn't be, but at the same time, it's also a message that even the freaks in this world are capable of having a high self-confidence, so why aren't you? And this is kind of the hidden meta-narrative of ghouls for Lovecraft. This is the first ghoul story I ever read as a kid, and is where the idea of ghoul feasts of Nitocris under the Great Pyramid is mentioned for the first time, while also heavily implying that this pyramid is indeed in the dreamlands. Mordigian, as a god, is featured in the Clark Ashton Smith story, The Charnel God, 1934. This is part of his Zothic cycle, which takes place at the end of time on the last inhabited continent of Earth. This very late date in humanity's history being another reason many people assume that Mordigian is merely an incarnation of Shurash Ho, talked about simply in this far-off distant future. Lastly, though it has barely any supernatural elements to it besides Wendigo imagery in the form of the stag man is NBC's Hannibal. Filled with such iconic lines as, it's only cannibalism if we're equals, from the titular character, and Will Graham, the other main character, effectively describing Hannibal as a skinwalker ghoul. He is one of those things we used to kill, but somebody kept it warm, kept it safe, until we had to deal with it today. This reimagined prequel series to the great crime psychological thriller Red Dragon actually is a perfect example of what it would be like to deal with a skinwalker ghoul who views themselves as a hunter of inferior men. Hannibal selects his prey based on who he sees as the most rude, kills them with extreme efficiency, and prepares their dead bodies as gourmet meals at his extravagant dinner parties. While viewing most humans as free game, he views his only friends to be FBI agent Jack Crawford and profiler Will Graham who he will go to great lengths to protect until Season 3, which ruined everything. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, ghouls are simply fun. They are underutilized but spiritually represented in the horror you know of today. The ideas for stories with these monsters are as limitless as their cousin race, the Deep Ones, often misassociated with vampires or far more savage werewolves. They make a great criminal informant for any monster hunter character, horde of enemies that could randomly appear, or a tragic past for a skinwalker who regrets their transformation. It's easy to make a ghoul character work, as while they are technically immortal, if they're all their friends or human, being transported to the dreamlands after death does not ensure at all that they can still transform back into a human like they could before, or that they will be able to navigate the ghoul tunnels well enough to make it back to their party, or more importantly, their old life. The character would be effectively dead. It would also be a great way to have one of your player characters come back in a later game as an NPC. My final note for this video is echoing the same criticisms as Seth Skorikowski towards the Peterson's Field Guide of Lovecraftian Horrors. While it gets the lore right, the art clearly depicts the more zombified ghoul common in other settings. This was clearly a problem with the artist and not with Sandy Peterson himself. 
We know this because he has a very lore accurate video on Lovecraft schools, linked below. As always, my source list is located in the description box under the timestamps and above those very easy to use donation links. Please support this work if you enjoyed it, and have a lovely day.